We will now hear from a member of our faculty selected by the graduating class to address us today, Professor John Bloom. <laughs> Professor Bloom joined the Cornell Law School faculty in 1997. He's a 1978 graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, 1982 graduate of the Yale Divinity School, and a 1984 graduate of the Yale Law School. He, he specializes in capital punishment, habeas corpus, criminal procedure, and evidence, and has pub published numerous articles and books in those fields. He helped create and serves as the director of the Cornell Death Penalty Project, which sponsors clinics in which students assist in the representation of capital defendants, both at the trial and appellate levels. And the project also conducts empirical research on the administration of capital punishment in the United States. An experienced litigator, Professor Bloom has argued eight cases before the United States Supreme Court, uh, as well as cases in the United States Courts of Appeals for the Second, Fourth, Fifth, Seventh, Ninth, and Eleventh Circuits, and more than 50 capital cases at trial. Please join me in welcoming Professor Bloom. First, I want to thank the class of 2013 for asking me to give this talk on this very important day in your lives. My remarks today will be drawn primarily from two milestones. First, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the Supreme Court's decision in Gideon versus Wainwright, which guaranteed indigent defendants the right to counsel in criminal cases. Second, this is the 20th anniversary of the founding of the Cornell Capital Punishment Clinic. Exactly 20 years ago this semester, my frequent co-teacher, co-author, colleague, and friend, Sherry Johnson and I taught the Capital Punishment Clinic for the first time. And having the opportunity to teach that course for the last 20 years has been the most rewarding professional experience of my life. First, a few words about Gideon. The court's decision unquestionably made a significant impact to many defendants. Persons charged with crimes should have lawyers. But it is not enough that defendants have lawyers. They need a competent attorney who has the tools and the skills to mount a vigorous defense. And on that score, Gideon is still an unfunded mandate. It is an unfulfilled promise. Because the right to counsel is only as good as the right for gauging the quality of that representation, the effective assistance of counsel. And the standard for that, announced 30 years ago by the Supreme Court, has proven so difficult to meet that shockingly poor representation is often found adequate. As my former law partner David Bruck used to say, if you hold a mirror under a defense lawyer's nose and it fogs up, then the Sixth Amendment was satisfied. <laughs> and the field in which I practice the death penalty, it is generally known that people get the death penalty not for committing the worst crime, but for having the worst lawyer. And that brings me to the 20th anniversary of the founding of the Cornell Capital Punishment Clinic. One of our clients that very first semester was a man by the name of Edward Lee Elmore. Mr. Elmore, who is African American, was convicted of the brutal rape murder of an elderly white female in rural South Carolina. The case against him was circumstantial. He did yard work for the victim. His fingerprint was found in her garage. A clump of hairs allegedly found on the victim's bed which based upon its unique auburn color and later on hair comparison analysis was said to be his. Blood stains found on his pants, which were the same blood type as that of the victim. An autopsy report placing the time of death during the one short period of time during which Mr. Elmore did not have a rock solid alibi. And of course, Old Faithful, a jailhouse snitch, an informant who claimed that Elmore admitted to him that he committed the crime. Two attorneys were appointed to represent Mr. Elmore. One was widely known as the town drunk. The other, and excuse me for using this lawyer's language, but his very first words to Mr. Elmore when he went to meet him in the county jail were of all the luck, I get appointed to represent a red-headed N. And he did not say N. That 
was Mr. Elmore's experience with the right to counsel guaranteed by Gideon. And it did not get better. His attorneys did absolutely no investigation of the state's circumstantial case. They did not ask for or spend a single dollar on investigators or experts. Not surprisingly, Mr. Elmore was convicted and he was sentenced to death. And we, along with our students, were part of the post-conviction team that represented Mr. Elmore. And we found during our work that the state's case could not withstand scrutiny. The pathologist admitted that her conclusions about time of death came solely from law enforcement and had no scientific basis. A detailed review of the evidence inventory sheet showed that no blood was found on his pants during the initial inspection, but was only found after blood was taken from Mr. Elmore, supposedly for testing purposes, and after the pants were checked out of evidence by the chief investigating officer. No pictures were taken of this clump of hairs found on the bed, a fact which the examiners could not explain given its obvious significance and the fact that they took literally hundreds of photos that day. What the crime scene examiners labeled as a blue fiber turned out on further inspection to actually be a male pubic hair, which DNA testing demonstrated was not Mr. Elmore's. And the informant recanted his testimony and admitted that his testimony was a lie and took a polygraph and passed, saying that his trial testimony was a lie. Despite the complete erosion of the case against Mr. Elmore, we continued to lose. The state courts could not admit that a mistake of that magnitude had been made. And the case churned on slowly into federal habeas corpus, and our clinic students of those years continued to work on the case and help draft the federal filings. We went back to state court after a Supreme Court decision that held that persons with intellectual disabilities or mental retardation could not be executed. And again, with the help of our clinic students, Mr. Elmore's death sentence was set aside. And finally, in early 2012, the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, one of the most conservative federal courts of appeal in the country, noting the high likelihood of a wrongful conviction, found that Mr. Elmore's lawyers were grossly incompetent and reversed the conviction. And in March of last year, Mr. Elmore heard the words he had waited 32 years to hear when a state court judge looked down at him from the bench and said, Mr. Elmore, you are free to go. And he walked out of that courthouse into a beautiful spring South Carolina day and breathed the air as a free man. And as a lawyer, you don't have better days than that. And as a teacher, I have never been more proud of my students who helped obtain this victory or to this law school for their efforts and support over the years. But as happy as the story of Mr. Elmore ends, it is also a tragedy because there is nothing, there is nothing that can give him back the 32 years of his life that were taken from him because of his trial lawyer's incompetence. Mr. Elmore's story may be at one end of the spectrum, but it is not unique. The poor do not have meaningful access to justice in criminal cases, in civil cases, or in family court proceedings. Public defender offices are understaffed and underfunded. Less than 3% of the entire money that goes into the criminal justice system is given to indigent defense. Many court-appointed lawyers are very good, but others are terrible. There are 35 men on death row in Florida whose lawyers did not file their federal habeas petitions on time. And because they missed the limitations period, these men, whose lives are literally on the line, are not going to get any federal review of their convictions or sentences. And the picture is just as bleak on the civil side. In New York City, 80% of the people that go to legal services for assistance are turned away. And the same is true nationally. Four out of five people who ask for help because they are too poor are rejected. This is not just deeply troubling. It is wrong, it is immoral, and we have to do better. And so class of 2013, what I want to say to you is that your sole mission once you leave here, and of course, after that little matter of the bar exam, is not to make large sums of money, although I wish you all financial success. It is not to become highly skilled practitioners of the art of being a lawyer, although I hope you all do. It is not to win cases, although again, I want you to have successful careers. It is not to become partner, be a judge, or famous. A part 
an important and vital part of your professional life from this day forward is to make the legal system more just. It is to do justice. And that means no matter where you are going, whether to work for a large firm or a small firm, whether to work for government or for the public interest organization, you have an obligation to help the poor. As Dean Schwab said, before I went to law school, I went to divinity school. And my favorite theologian then and now was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was executed shortly before the end of World War II for his involvement in a plot to assassinate Hitler, something which he reluctantly agreed had to be done. And in one of his writings during his imprisonment prior to his execution, Bonhoeffer observed this. There is an experience of incomparable value to see things from below, from the perspective of the outcasts, the suspects, the maltreated, the powerless, the oppressed, the reviled. In short, from those who suffer, to look with new eyes on matters great and small. And it was these words in context that led me to law school. When I was a divinity student 30 years ago, I started working at New Haven Legal Assistance in the criminal law unit. My job was to try and find alternatives to incarceration for our clients. And my first week there, one of the lawyers took me to roll call, which is where everyone that is charged with a crime is brought in for a status update on their case. And when I got there, it was like I'd stepped back in time 250 years and a slave ship had docked. A bus pulled up from the jail and scores of black men in jumpsuits and change were ushered into the courtroom. And as a son of the South who was raised in the 70s and 80s, I had seen racial inequality and prejudice, and I had seen its ugliness. But there was something about seeing it on that scale that made a tremendous impact on me. And I would like to say that things have changed in 30 years, but they haven't. If you go to any major urban area to a roll call, the scene I just described is replicated every week in this country. Then there was our client, Arnold Green. Arnold was 16, out on bond, charged with a petty juvenile offense. He had a drug problem. His mother was a prostitute, a drug addict, and an alcoholic. He lived in a very rough housing project in New Haven, which was a tough town in the late 1970s. And I was trying to get Arnold into a drug rehab program so he, to keep him out of the juvenile institution because even then I knew that that would be a certain pathway to adult prison. Arnold was a good kid underneath it all, and he would sometimes stay with me when his mother was on a drug or alcohol binge. And one night, I got a call. Arnold had been arrested again. He and several friends were out running the streets, which they should not have been, and one of the kids, not Arnold, tried to rob an 80-year-old man as he entered his building. And the man had a heart attack and died. And Arnold was charged, as were the other boys, with felony murder. I was naive then. I did not understand accomplice liability or that you took a victim as you found them. And I was shattered when Arnold was waved up to adult court and sent to prison. I just kept thinking how unfair it was and how tragic. And I decided that I could do more to help the poor and the disadvantaged if I went to law school. It was my involvement with the poor, the powerless, the oppressed, and the reviled, as Bonhoeffer called them, that changed my path in life. And all of us have decisions we regret, but I have never had any regret at all about my decision to go to law school. Even in my darkest professional hour in 1988 and 89, when Professor Johnson and I lost six clients to the executioner in eight weeks, I have never thought twice. Throughout my career as a lawyer in private practice, as a director of a nonprofit corporation, and as a member of this faculty, I have loved the law, and I cannot imagine doing anything else. Because ours is a noble profession. From the founding of the Republic to this day, lawyers have made a profound difference in all aspects of public life. But it carries with it the obligation to help those who don't have the financial means to help themselves. It doesn't have to be anything flashy. Whether it's helping a poor woman in an abusive relationship get a divorce, a family stay in a house or apartment, a child facing suspension stay in school, a disabled person with a benefits problem, or a defendant with a misdemeanor. These are all very, very important cases to the people whose lives are affected by them. And if for any reason, because of restrictions to your employment, you cannot represent someone pro bono, do something else. 
volunteer at a battered women's shelter, a homeless shelter, an inner city school, or a soup kitchen. And for those of you getting your LLM today, I don't claim to know what the most pressing problems are in your home country, but there are things that you can do and that you should do to help the poor wherever you go. Doing so will change the lives of the people you help, but it will also change your life and make it more richer and more rewarding. Robert Kennedy once said, few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. It is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. And so in closing class of 2013, I want to leave you with two things that my second favorite theologian, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said. The first is this, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle the tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. I hope that all of you will become part of that cadre of dedicated individuals to which Dr. King was referring. And second, he said, we stand on the shoulders of others so that one day others may stand on our shoulders. That day has come and it is now your time. It is now your time to take your place among the generations of lawyers who have gone before you that have put justice first. It is now your time to stand with those graduates of this great law school who have done their part to help the poor and disadvantaged, whether working in government, in private practice, or for public interest organizations. It is now your time to follow the lead of people like Peggy Lee, who since her graduation in 96 has worked for Southeastern Ohio Legal Services helping poor people who have been denied public benefits. Like Neil Getnick, whose daughter Courtney Fennerty you heard from earlier today, who has spent his career tirelessly working to prevent fraud and promote business integrity. Like Jay Wax from the class of 71, who despite being a partner at Kay Schuller, spends hundreds of hours a year on pro bono work helping women and children like Charlotte Lanvers in the class of 2007, who worked first with the Disability Rights Center and is now an attorney at the Department of Education helping people with disabilities. And like Emily Pavela from the class of 2005, who left her job at a large law firm to go work for the South Carolina Death Penalty Defense and Resource Center, and she has made a tremendous difference in the quality of post-conviction representation in that state. So class of 2013, Godspeed and good luck. And remember that although you leave us here today, you will always be part of the Cornell Law School family. We will miss you all, and I will especially miss my clinic students that leave us here today. And if there's anything we can do to help you, please call on us, and please come back to see us. Now go and take your place in the world. Stand tall. Stand tall for justice. May your shoulders be strong and broad for those that come after you. The moment has come and it is now your time.